Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. The Apostle Paul called Epaphroditus and Archippus fellow soldiers. Philippians 2, 25, Philemon 1, verse 2. He told the young evangelist Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. He also told Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He also wrote to Timothy, I have fought a good fight. In two of these instances, some scholars emphasize that these references are to the athletic games. I get that, but the same Greek word is used in John 18, 36, when Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But now, we have an unmistakable reference to Christians as soldiers in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So we see this battle is against Satan and spiritual wickedness. Central to success in this battle is the bold declaration of the gospel. Furthermore, we read in Jude, verse 3, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The metaphor of a fight certainly inheres in the phrase, contend earnestly for the faith. The New Century Version reads, I want to encourage you to fight hard for the faith. The New Living Translation reads, I must write, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. That's the great task God places upon his people, defending the faith. And again, in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or with gentleness and respect. And so we must be wise enough and self-aware enough as Christians to contend without being contentious, to defend without being defensive, and to be tenacious without being pugnacious in our great spiritual battle. So meaningful in this context is 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What a riveting call to arms. When I read that scripture, I think of songs like, Stand up for Jesus and rise up, O men of God. Brothers, the Holy Spirit is telling us, quit ye like men, to use the King James, or man up in modern lingo. We must hold the banner high and stand in the gap for the captain of our salvation. You get what I'm saying. 
the weapons of our warfare after our song. Imagine a war where one side doesn't realize they're being attacked. How well is that going to turn out for them? Yet many people live every day unaware of Satan's attacks. Oh, they have job problems, family problems, drinking problems, drug problems, porn problems, anger and anxiety problems, and they can't figure out what's wrong. Satan uses all the wiles, all the tools at his disposal to undermine man's faith and to make man miserable. Back to 2 Corinthians 10. The Holy Spirit explains, verse 3, that though Christians live in bodies of flesh, we fight in a spiritual war. Of course, it would be senseless to use bombs, bullets, and bayonets in spiritual battles. The Apostle Paul writes about the weapons of our warfare. The word warfare comes from the Greek word stratias, from where we get the word strategy. Satan has a plan, but so does the Lord. We're not shadow boxing. We're not striking out blindly in fits of emotion. We follow the strategy the Lord provides. We do not fixate on the personalities through whom Satan promotes his agenda. We go for the juggler. We strike at the heart. We pull down the strongholds. We demolish the fortresses of arrogance and ignorance, evil and falsehood. Yes, that's what Jesus and the apostles did, but that work must be done in every generation and in every location. J. D. McGarvey writes, quote, Paul evidently alludes to a large military engine with a great claw used to pull down the walls of castles forts, and other strongholds. Stanley thinks that Paul has in mind military operations which occurred in Cilicia, where Paul was from. In the hills and the mountains of that locality, bands of pirates and robbers entrenched themselves and for a while withstood the Roman arms. Cicero made some headway in suppressing them, and on his return he was honored with a Roman triumph but the final victory was achieved by Pompey, the generation before Paul was born. Pompey made great use of a great claw or hook, for he pulled down 120 fortresses. No, we're not apostles, but we have their military strategy and battle tactics in Holy Scripture. What did, that, what did that look like? Pulling down strongholds means exposing the rational and scriptural flaws in false arguments or reasonings. Which arguments? Number one, arguments, this is what he's saying, that undermine the reality of God's existence. And number two, arguments intended to marginalize or downplay the need to obey God. Can you see how these inspired instructions 
still connect with Satan's strongholds in our culture 2,000 years later? I mean, the word obey is, is like a four-letter word, even in religious circles sometimes. Can you see Satan's two-pronged attack executed by those captive to do his will? So let's take a closer look at the charge. First destructive, then constructive. That's the charge given to the soldier in the Lord's army. The Christian soldier first serves on the Lord's wrecking crew. He casts down arguments and every high thing, every fortress or tower, like intellectualism and pseudo-scholarship, every high thing that's erected to prevent men from recognizing God's existence. Next, when and where this is successful and accomplished, men in God, uh, men believe in God, then the Lord's army builds its own fortification around complete center, surrender and submission to God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, unraveling and untangling any arguments presented to hinder men from obeying God. And so central to our work in defending the kingdom of God is refuting arguments. Exposing lies. Satan has been lying ever since Genesis 3. He twists the truth and he puts it in an appealing package. So we'll take it and accept it, just like Adam and Eve. Blaise Pascal shrewdly points out people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. What kind of a weapons enable us to cast down? Satan's strongholds. Here's one, prayer. Prayer empowers us to take down those strongholds. In Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 20, the Apostle Paul counsels soldiers of Christ on how to be victorious against spiritual evil. He spends 69 inspired words first to stress the importance of going into battle with a sword and five pieces of spiritual armor. But then, watch this. He spends the next 69 words addressing how critical perseverance in prayer is for themselves, ourselves, and for his great work as an apostle and proclaimer of the gospel. The only specificity Paul gives in his prayer request is that he might speak boldly. To do what? To cast down arguments that, number one, interfere with men knowing God, and number two, interfere with obeying God. Hear the emphasis on speaking boldly in his prayer request. Verse 19, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly. Verse 20, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Well, another weapon for our warfare, of course, is scripture. That's the content of so much of what we're gonna share. Scripture stabilizes the soul and it fosters faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Basic training for the Christian involves feeding on the milk of God's word, reading the scriptures, studying the word of God personally, and with others who have more knowledge and experience. These activities, in turn, give us the ability to properly handle the sword of the spirit, the word of God, ourselves, in defending the faith. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4, verse 12. Jesus defeated the devil, remember? With the word saying, it is written, Matthew chapter 4. The Holy Spirit uses other metaphors to express this same truth about the word. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Earlier, God had given Jeremiah his basic instructions. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah 1.10. Let's remember, as David put it, the battle is the Lord's. But the Lord needs men like David and Isaiah, willing to stand up and say, here am I, send me. He needs brave volunteers. King Saul's armor swallowed up the young David, 
But God still used David to defeat Goliath, a mountain of a man with a massive sword, using only a slingshot and a stone. David's great faith is what made the difference. Certainly, faith is a weapon in our warfare. Faith fortifies our hearts and minds against the various flaming arrows Satan fires at us. Our faith forms a massive shield of protection, Ephesians 6, verse 16. Don't let the world under Satan's sway devalue the true meaning of faith in your mind. One Oxford definition of faith is only partially correct. Quote, strong belief in God or in the doctrines of religion. So far, so good on the meaning of faith. But then, based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof, end quote. The second half of that definition suggests that faith is not based on evidence, but it's uh, based on nebulous, unwarranted fear. That definition misses the mark. Richard Dawkins goes next level in attacking faith. He writes in his book, The God Delusion, quote, What is really pernicious is the practice of teaching children that faith itself is a virtue. Faith is an evil, he says, precisely because it requires no justification and brooks no argument, end quote. Professor John Lennox of Oxford University points out, we do not speak of proof. You only get proof in the strict sense in my own field of mathematics. But in every other field, we can't speak of proof. We can speak of evidence, of pointers of being convinced beyond reasonable doubt. End quote. Evolutionary scientists pretend that their worldview is purely science or scientific, while denigrating the faith of Christians as if it rests on silly superstitions like those of the ancient Greek and Roman pagans. Professor John Lennox exposed this thinking error in his debate with Princeton professor Peter Singer. Lincoln, uh, Lennox, rather, explained. In opening debate remarks, I often point out that my parents were Christian. Singer responded, There's my main objection. People stay in the religion in which they were brought up. Lennox later asked, Were your parents atheists? Singer said, Yes. Lennox said, So you stayed in the faith in which you grew up? Singer said, It it isn't a faith. Lennox replied, Peter. I'm very sorry. I thought you believed it. Christians have always contended for creation, as recorded in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. Now, atheistic evolutionary scientists have abandoned the conclusions held by their kind in previous generations and concede a beginning. They call it the Big Bang. When Professor Lennox pointed out in his debate with Richard Dawkins that the Bible always had it right, Dawkins downplayed the fact, saying that, well, there were only two choices, and Scripture had a 50% chance of getting it right. Dawkins seems to have missed the point. Evolutionary scientists had the same great odds in their favor thousands of years later, yet they got it wrong and did for a very long time. Interestingly, one argument atheists like Dawkins raise against faith in God and the Bible is the existence of miracles, like the virgin birth of Jesus, Jesus turning water into wine, and Jesus being resurrected. These men insist that they can only believe in the natural and could never believe in the supernatural that they read about in the Bible. That statement, however, is just not true. Consider the implications of atheistic evolutionary scientists believing in the beginning associated with the Big Bang, as they call it. Follow me closely. This fact means that everyone now believes either that someone, God, created everything out of nothing. Christians hold to this supernatural conclusion. Meanwhile, Scientists may hold to this conclusion, as do many renowned scientists in history, 
and even big name scientists today like James Tour and Francis Collins. The only other option involves an even greater miracle and extreme credulity, faith based on a whim and a wish. Those who reject God's involvement in creation believe, get this, that no one created everything out of nothing. Now, which of those two explanations is the more rational? The atheist position goes against scientific law, the law of cause and effect. The atheist concludes that the effect of the universe has no cause. Everything here has no cause. The Holy Spirit alluded to the fact this law, the law of cause and effect, in our material universe in Hebrews 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. While Scripture provides strong evidence for God's existence, don't think for a moment that Scripture is the only weapon in our warfare. Jesus said, I am the truth. John 14, 6. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, John 14, 17. We read that it's impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6, verse 18. Meanwhile, Satan is a liar and the father of it, John 8, 44. You see, truth is God's domain and Satan's kryptonite. Augustine said the Christian ought to learn as much as he can about as many things as he can because all truth is God's truth. And that's right. Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, said, Science, true science, is the search for truth. Truth is always on God's side. We've noticed from Scripture, but also from science and reason, evidence for the existence of God. That's part of what our battle is all about. Even secular and scientific truths may be used in our arsenal to pull down Satan's strongholds. Anytime we can expose a lie of Satan, the kingdom of darkness takes a hit. Even when Christians effectively cast down arguments against the knowledge of God with biblical evidence, science, and reason, he may wonder, why can't everyone see the truth? That is a mystery. But don't be discouraged. The truth can only penetrate the skulls seeking it. Matthew 7, verse 6 and 7. We're all vulnerable to believing a lie. When legendary magician Henry Houdini came to a town to do his show, he often went to the local jail, gathering a crowd of people along the way. To get Buzz going about his upcoming performance, he asked the jailer to lock him in a cell. Time after time, jail after jail, town after town, Houdini escaped within minutes. But one jailer had heard that Houdini was coming, and the jailer was ready. When Houdini closed the cell door, the jailer put the key in the lock and secretly turned it in the wrong direction. He then removed the key, and everyone watched as Houdini struggled to escape by knowingly locking himself in repeatedly. Finally, in frustration, Houdini admitted that he could not escape. The jailer then revealed his deception. Houdini had believed a lie, and the lie had held him captive. Listen, God is a gentleman and will not force himself on anyone. People will believe lies. The Holy Spirit teaches in 2 Thessalonians 2 that God will send those who do not love the truth a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Blaise Pascal put it eloquently nearly 400 years ago. In faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. That's why Jesus urges man to genuinely seek in order that they may find. If you'd like to get a copy of this message, stay with us. And we'll tell you how to do so after our song.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray you've heard God speak to you through his word. If you'd like a copy of this sermon, The Weapons of Our Warfare, 1455, please reach out. We also offer our free Bible study course. You can visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to view videos, hear audio, and read transcripts of over 500 Bible-based sermons. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you.